Oh, hi. I didn't expect you to hit play so soon. You're here for the sign writing course? Ah, okay. No, no, don't worry, come in. I'm just finishing up some lunch. Um, let me get squared away and I'll be with you in just a minute. So you're from Morecambe? Fantastic. I used to go there on holiday when I was a kid. Lots of great memories. So you'd like to try a bit of sign painting? Fantastic. Well, it's not the typical way I would teach, but such is the world right now that online learning is the way to go. It's actually the way that I learned. When I first started, there wasn't many sign painters that I could speak to, so I taught myself by watching YouTube videos. I would also buy any books I could find on the subject, and it's with that DIY spirit that I'd like you to join me in this beginner's guide to sign painting. One of the best ways to learn about any kind of trade is to look inside the trade person's bag. And so, let's take a dive in and see some of the typical tools that a sign painter might take on a job. The first place to start would be to look at the sign painter's brushes. Some of these are animal hair and some synthetic and they come in different shapes and sizes. Sign painter's enamel paint is typically oil based and dries to a high gloss finish. White spirit is used to thin the paint and to clean your brushes. Cups are used to hold your paint or your white spirit and stirrers for mixing paint. The tool that everyone seems to ask about, the mouse stick, it's used to keep your hands from touching the surface in which you're painting. Measuring tape for accuracy. A chalk line might be used in order to get an accurate baseline for your painting. Masking tape is always handy. A pounce pad holds chalk and allows you to transfer your design from your pounce pattern onto the surface. And this is the pounce pattern which would contain your design. It's basically just a chalk stencil. Typical drawing tools might feature a couple of different rulers and some different pencils. Ones that can draw on glass or on concrete are always handy. I find a multi-tool to be quite handy. It's obviously got a variety of different uses. Just uh, remember to take it out of your pocket when you go to the pub. Applying a small amount of neat sweet oil to your brushes once you've finished using them keeps them from drying out and gives them a nice shape. And last but not least, the thing I always forget to bring. Something to clean up with. Thankfully, to learn the basics of lettering and sign painting, we don't need quite as many tools. But let's now have a look at what we will need. Most flat acrylic brushes will work, as too would the synthetic, longer haired sign painters brushes. Good quality acrylic paint. It might take a while to find the right brand, it's sometimes a bit of trial and error. A less costly alternative could be a small vial of acrylic ink. Any kind of container that you have that could hold a quantity of paint or water. Finding the correct paper is important. If it's too porous, it will soak up the ink and bleed out. This particular paper is used for sewing patterns. It's called uh, dots and crosses. Another good alternative is craft paper, as it's quite easy to find and pretty cheap. Masking tape in order to hold your paper onto your working surface. Nothing too glamorous here, just a ruler and pencil will do. Some people don't feel comfortable using a mouse stick to begin with, but if you want to give it a try, a simple piece of doweling with some tape on the end will do the job. Mm -hmm. 
Finding the right brush is the first roadblock that many face when they first start out lettering. Find the right consistency of paint. If it's too wet, you'll make a mess of the carpet. And if it's too dry, you'll be there all day. Palleting your brush on the rim of a cup or on a flat surface is really important. It keeps your brush nice and sharp. As we move forward, it's important that you have a few things in front of you. A brush, a cup of paint, a cup of water, a ruler, a pencil, and be in a comfortable environment. That may mean being sat at a desk uh, with a slightly angled flat surface in front of you, or you could even tape the paper against a wall and stand upright. Let's start with some casual lettering. Draw in your baseline and mark 7cm above. Because casual lettering is usually in italic, you might want to draw in some slanted lines to help you. Pencil in your intended letters. Make sure you give yourself enough space between each. Before you paint, make sure you have the right consistency and that your brush is well palleted. Each letter being painted can be broken down into a few stages and here it is highlighted by the use of different colours, yellow being the first, red being the second and blue being the third. Remember that the letters that you penciled in at the start are just a guideline. You don't have to follow them if it means that your letters will look weird. Do your own thing. Let's look at these brush strokes using just one colour. Most of these letters are painted with a downward stroke. Sometimes there's a sideways stroke or a diagonal stroke, but very rarely is there an upward stroke. If you can paint one letter, you can paint the entire alphabet. Let's look at ways in which you can expand one letter out to all letters. If you can paint the letter A, it's really only one stroke difference in order to paint the letter N. letter B really isn't that much different from the letter R. And the curvature of the letter C allows you to paint letters like G or O or Q. Let's now look at ways to render some block lettering. Unlike the free-flowing nature of casual lettering, block lettering requires more in the way of draftsmanship. Feel free to follow along using the measurements provided. You may need to pause and replay.
Setting out ample space between your letters is known as kerning. For this example, the width of each line will be 1.5 cm. Feel free to add as many guidelines as you think you need. This is the foundation of each letter, so the more accurate your foundation, the better your letter. As you can see here, I'm using a few different Sharpie pens, but that's merely to aid visibility for this video. You would be using a pencil and a rubber eraser to fix any lines you need. Try using a dashed line when you're drawing curves. Even if the letter you're drawing is entirely curved, like the letter C or O, it's still important that you use a square foundation. Okay, so I think this is about the right amount of guidelines needed. Let's now try and paint. In order to achieve sharp edges, you will need to twist your brush into each corner. This requires not only mobility in your wrist, but also your fingers. Look at the green flag on the end of my brush to see how the brush is twisted into each corner. As you'll notice, the brush rarely stays on a straight path. You're constantly twisting the brush and rotating your fingers, whether it's a straight line or a curve. Sometimes you can feel a certain amount of stress when you're first starting out lettering, so it's really important to have an open posture. It means breathing freely and making sure your wrist and your fingers are mobile. forget to palette that brush between every stroke.
I understand this is a lot to take in, so let's go back to the very start one last time. Let's paint the letter A together. Start by drawing a 10 cm squared box and a dashed line down the center. Mark the two bottom corners and one centimeter out left and right from the middle line. Connect the dots and draw in two horizontal lines of the same width. Holding your brush midway up the handle using the tips of your thumb, index finger and middle finger will allow you to twist the brush and get these nice sharp edges. When first learning lettering, the process of capping off the end of each stroke is sometimes a real challenge, so this is where it becomes really important to twist the brush and twist the fingers. Well, let's call that tea time. That was a lot to take in, but I think you did really well. It's worth reminding ourselves that none of what we've covered today is easy. It's a real challenge. Looking back on my own experience, I, I felt like giving up so many times. But something just told me that if I just kept trying, eventually I would get it right. It may be a cliche, but sometimes it's true. Practice makes perfect. Perfect? Oh, for f-